Hey, besties, this is The Ethics Experts with Giovanni Gallo, your host here, and I am super excited to introduce you and feature Joey Coleman, the author of Never Lose a Customer Again. Joey, welcome to the show, man. Hey, thanks so much, Gio. Excited to be here. Uh, yeah, so glad you could make it. Um, so uh, you're in Boulder right now, is that right? I am, yes. I'm based in okay. Colorado. I mean, who doesn't love Boulder? It's awesome out there. Well, there's great fun. It's a beautiful state, and uh, we definitely uh, enjoy our time here. Cool. Um, yeah, so we, today we're going to get into some stuff about your book, which is awesome. Uh, everyone should get it. Just pause the cast and go jump on Amazon and buy it now. Uh, never lose a customer again. Uh, so we'll get into that, and then we're going to be talking about culture and how um, ethics experts as leaders within an organization can take some things from your book and apply them to being a more strategic impact on an organization. But, Joey, before we get into that, we really care about people. That's what ethics and, and compliance and you know, business leadership is all about to me and to us is um, you know, understanding the impact that it has on people. So we always like to feature people's personal stories. Um, so Joey, why don't you talk to us a little bit about your personal story, how you came to be the person you are today? Yeah, I've got a crazy eclectic path, Gio. Some might say that uh, he can't hold the job. Others would say he just has a lot of different interests. Uh, but the reality is um, I've my career has seen me work in a ton of completely different industries. So I studied government and international relations in undergrad. I went straight to law school where I studied national security law, uh, international law and litigation, had the opportunity to work for the Secret Service, the White House and the Office of Counsel to the President, uh, not the current administration, previous administration, uh, and the Central Intelligence Agency. I was a criminal defense lawyer. I taught at the postgraduate level. I ran a division of a promotional products company, uh, putting logos on all kinds of tchotchkes. I started and ran an ad agency for 15 years. And for about the last five years, I've been a full-time speaker and writer on experience. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, my book, Never Lose a Customer Again, is all about creating remarkable customer experiences. Uh, over the last few months, I've been working on my next book, which is all about employee experiences. Uh, so super excited to have had kind of an eclectic career that informs the perspective that I have today. That's awesome. Uh, so this is going to be a four hour podcast and we're going to talk about all your work <laughs> stories and the CIA and the Secret Service and all that. Uh, no, that's really um, obviously a bunch of interesting stuff there. Um, and, you know, I think that we'll we'll be talking a little bit about how that can, you know, inform and uh, really empower our audience, because I know that the stuff in your current book um, about customers is really it, it's awesome. I think the you know, the things that I've seen, I, I haven't had the pleasure of uh, seeing you speak live, but but, you know, the content that you put out um, really kind of seems to get the, uh, the importance of this focus. Um, you know, we, we should have this external, you know, we think a servant focus um, and, you know, understanding who your customer is, is really key to that. Um, but before we get into that, it's really interesting how um, you've kind of moved between these, these different roles. Um, we find that a lot of people in ethics and integrity programs and compliance um, often have this kind of winding route to where they end up. Um, what has really driven, you know, those changes and like how, how has, how, how have your decisions on kind of what you're going for changed over the years? Yeah, I think w what's interesting is career paths often make a lot more sense looking backwards than they do looking forwards, or at least in my experience. Uh, you know, I've been very fortunate that every job I've ever had, every position I've had, ever had, uh, I've moved to that position because it felt more interesting and more exciting than what I was doing. Okay. It's not that I left something because I hated it. I left it because I found something else that I liked more. And the thread that ties all of these positions and all of these different uh, career iterations together is the human condition, right? So what is it that makes people do the things that they do? And what can we do to influence, per persuade, convince, encourage them to do the things we'd like them to do? 
So when I was working uh, in the intelligence community, hey, we'd like to find out this information from someone. What can we do to convince them to share the information? When I was working as a criminal defense lawyer, we'd like the jury to find my guy not guilty. And frankly, it was always a guy. Uh, you know, what can we do to, uh, you know, convince and persuade the jury to find them not guilty. When I was running my ad agency, we want somebody to buy more widgets that our client is selling. What can we do to convince somebody to do that? And really, when you think about it, I believe that all of our life is about positioning, persuasion, conversation, interaction, human motivation, the psychology of the human condition. And so I feel very fortunate to have had the opportunity to learn about that and dive deeply into those topics from a number of different perspectives in different industries. Because I think together, the gestalt combination of all of those things is what's produced uh, kind of the insights or the perspective that I'm able to share with my clients and my audiences. Yeah, that's great, man. I love how you've kind of seen that tie through through these different roles, um, you know, may, you know, I think maybe a lot of people from the outside wouldn't see that immediate connection between the central intelligence agency and an ad agency. <laughs> um, yeah. But you know, I think it's cool that you've seen kind of how your heart has been expressed and drawn to those different things, and it really is about this human condition. And you know, it's something that we see a lot um, in our industry and in our profession that you know, ethics experts have they've come from you know they've been nurses or accountants or lawyers or you know. Know, HR professionals or, or whatever, um, you know, or, or something even more far flung than that. But they all see this, this point that people matter, that if you dig in and you can, get, if you do this stuff right, people's lives are better. And then ultimately the path to, to making people's lives better is usually primarily, um, you know, if not, uh, you know, at, at least partially due to trying to influence people trying to convince them. And our whole industry is kind of moving from this compliance 1.0 of legal defensibility to this compliance 3.0 of, well, let's get effectiveness. Let's get the right behavior. Let's not just have plausible deniability, but let's help people, like make it easy for them to do the right thing. And let's, you know, impact them with our influence and, you know, our programs and our communication, not just here's a policy and let's assume that everyone memorizes it. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, for what it's worth, and I, I don't mean this to be critical of any of your listeners or the branding or the positioning, but I- Oh, I, we're used to it. Go ahead, bring it. I, well, I think, <laughs> yeah, there, you know, I mean, there's an interesting thing. So I'm a recovering attorney, right? And everybody, when they talk about attorneys, they always quote Shakespeare's line, first things first, kill all the lawyers. What they don't realize is the contextuality of that quote. It comes in a play where they're talking about if we want to destroy society, what do we do? Well, the first thing is we kill all the lawyers. And the reason we kill all the lawyers is the lawyers are the ones who are responsible for maintaining a sense of order and justness and ethics. And so if we wanna get rid of all society, we get rid of all the lawyers. I think compliance professionals often find themselves in that same lens in the sense that people presume by the very nature of the role and position that these are folks that love to say no, that love to walk around with a magnifying glass trying to find somebody step out of line. And to be frank, as a branding and nomenclature guy, the concept of compliance uh, doesn't help that attitude, right? Yeah. If, if no one in the history of the world uh, was excited about complying, okay? Yeah. That's not, uh, it's, it's it, not, it's uh, not inspiring to not inspiring. apply. Exactly. And it goes, I posit, it goes counter to the human condition. Rather, if we come at it from a lens, as you alluded to, in like a 3.0 culture type in, uh, perspective, what is encouragement? What does persuasion look like? Because in my experience, you know, I, I've got two young boys. I've got a seven-year-old and a four-year-old. And if I go around all day, every day saying, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, I get one type of interaction and response metric, which is usually not that exciting for me to be a part of. Yes. Whereas if I go around saying, hey, everything is a choice. Let's do our best to make good choices. And instead we evaluate every situation and say, what are the choices? I mean, I play a game with my boys pretty regularly where we say, you know, okay, where are we at right now? What are our choices? Right. And have them think through 
the fact that in any scenario, there are a minimum, absolute minimum of three choices. In any scenario ever in the world that you could come up with, there's at least three choices, minimum. In my experience, the more you can increase the number of choices you have from the place you're at, the better, the richer, the more fulfilled your life will be. And so I think the opportunity to tie it back to your listeners is when it comes to compliance, we should think less about you need to do X and rather from the place you're at, given the opportunity of choices you have, X is actually the best one, which is why we're encouraging you to do that. But if you have a Y and a Z or a Y and a Z for our uh, international <laughs> listeners. Thank you, Joey. And, and you want to come at this with a different idea, bring that to me. Bring that to me as the compliance officer, and I will then be able to either explain why that's not actually a good idea because of additional elements you may not be aware of in your position or your functional role, or it may allow me to deepen my understanding of the scenario and suddenly compliance shifts to a different recommendation, right. which by the way, dramatically increases employee engagement and buy-in when your team feels like they're part of the solution instead of being part of the problem. Yeah, that's such a strong point. And it's something that we're all, you know, I, I think that there's, there's a big, um, you know, there's a big effort in there, you know, it's going to be a lot of effort for us to change some of those paradigms uh, because there are a lot of things that are required that, you know, there are regulations and there are things that, you know, we need to make sure that we do, but really the, the outcome that we want is proper behavior and engagement and a strong culture and, you know, achieving our company's mission. The path to that is not just kind of stopping at requirements, but figuring out how do we engage people in this? How do we engage people in a dialogue? How do we get the other divisions within the company to view compliance and ethics and integrity leaders as a strategic ally to help them achieve their goals and help the whole company achieve their mission rather than that kind of, you know, uh, that Dr. No. Um, and it's, I, I love that you bring it up. You clearly get the kind of the influence and, and the dynamic of, you know, trying to bring somebody in on that. And it's something that I think we as a profession uh, have a lot of work to do, but are starting to wake up to, okay, how do I do this effectively instead of just efficiently? Um, and it's something we're all growing toward. Absolutely. And I, you know, I think at the end of the day, uh, most humans, not all humans, most humans strive to be understood. Not all humans strive to understand. And I think there's an incredible opportunity for both the folks in the compliance role and those folks dealing with someone in the compliance role to have the conversation. Um, you know, I talk a lot in my book and in my presentations about uh, gifting and giving presence. And that's where the nature of my work most often bumps up against compliance topics, right? Usually when I say, hey, treat your customers well, Compliance is like, yes, we love that idea. And then I say, hey, the way to do that is to send them a gift. And compliance goes, whoa, 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 hang on a second. How much are you going to spend? What is the relationship? Undue influence. We've got regulations. I get it. I get it. What I encourage all of my clients who are in non-compliance roles to do is to get the compliance person into the conversation sooner rather than later. Don't come to them after you've developed the plan, you've purchased all the gifts, and you've started mailing them, okay? Bring them in when you say, we want to create a memento of our strategic appreciation. We want to create a talisman, a physical artifact of our appreciation of this client for their business or their prospective business, and we want to do that in a compliant way. What is the way we can do that? that is in alignment with ethics and good behavior as opposed to rubbing up against it or even just full out running into it. Yeah, that's such a good point. And, you know, the the better that we can have that conversation early and we can collaborate on, hey, here's the outcome. So if I can't buy them a Rolex, maybe I can, you know, kind of send, send them a nice note or, you know, just kind of do something that's within the bounds. We can collaborate on that and say, hey, you know, you may not know that this thing is too far, but I let, let me as an ethics expert help you figure out how to get the outcome that you want. And we want yeah, to build and a relationship I, and we want to appreciate people and stuff like that. You can do that without, you know, the appearance or actually, you know, bribing somebody. Absolutely. And I, and I think the, the real opportunity here, 
uh, from like a sales or a marketing point of view when thinking about how you interact with compliance. And I share this knowing that most of your listeners fall on the compliance side, but here's some ideas that you can throw back to the marketing and sales team when they're yep. pushing on you. In my experience, the way that you achieve the goal that marketing and sales has while still being under the proper umbrella of compliance and ethics is to have a keen understanding of the customer you're trying to deal with. Now, here's how that plays out. If I really know, if I don't know a customer well, my thought often could be, well, let's get them a Rolex because I'm sure they'd love a Rolex. It's a big brand, it's well known. Do, do, do. Everybody, when they see the Rolex, they Im immediately assume significant value in the gift. The ethics compliance officer might say, hey, we've got a $50 limit on gifting. So I don't think we can get a Rolex for $50 unless we're in New York and Washington Square Park and it's some dude in a trench coat. And even then, it's going to be a Rolex with two L's. Okay, so <laughs> it's like, stop and think about it. If we actually know about that customer and we know about their hobbies, their interests, their loves, their favorite author, for example, we can find their favorite author, reach out to the author, buy a signed personalized copy of the book, which I don't know how many authors uh, you've had the opportunity to interact with, Gio, but in my experience, anytime I've reached out to an author and said, I love your work, I wanna gift my client who loves your work with a personalized copy of your book, is there any way I could pay you more than the list price of the book to buy a copy that's personalized and have you send it to me? I have never had an author not say, hey, if you cover the cost of the book and postage, I'll sign it for free. Oh, okay. Which, by the way, means now you're well under what most companies have as their dollar threshold, because you're usually under $30, and most companies, $30 isn't going to get you into any trouble. The perceived value from an ethics or if it ever escalated into a compliance issue is much higher, but it's really difficult to put a dollar amount on a signed personalized book unless it's, you know, an incredibly insanely well-known author, right? You know, right. or something like that. But even then, you can, you're probably going to be okay, right? And so if we're willing to get creative and if we know something personal and emotional about the person we're trying to gift, suddenly it becomes a lot easier to do in a very compliant way. Yeah, it's a great point that when you know kind of what they value, you don't have to buy the generic value that has a high dollar amount. You can give them something, right? Because what is value? It's not, it's not just a dollar amount. A val value is perceived, right? And someone says, you, you know, you're, you're going for that connection of someone says, hey, you know what? I feel great about this. I, you know, I'm heard, right? You said people want to be understood. And if you can give a gift that's $12 that has a signature from the author that someone feels really understood, you can get that outcome without, without even having to spend the, the 50 on the Washington Square Park watch. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, it, it's interesting. One, one quick story of how this works in practical application. Uh, I was on a podcast with a great guy, uh, Ben Oosterveld, not too long ago. And in the conversation, Ben asked, we were talking about nostalgia, and he asked me something that I was nostalgic about or a hmm. toy that I played with when I was a kid. And I told him I used to play with G.I. Joe for action figures when I was okay. a kid, a lot, like many people my age, right? I mean, this, this was kind of the go-to uh, yeah. toy for a while there. Um, and I told him a story about how when I was a kid, on the back of G.I. Joe action figures, there was a little dossier about the action figure, right? A little card that you could cut out of the packaging that you could then put in a file box that said like the G.I. Joe figure's name and where they were from and what their specialties were. And some Yeah, it's like his baseball card. Yeah, exactly. I remember those. Yeah, for sure. Part of the G.I. Joe guy. Uh -huh. And I explained that when I was a kid, I loved G.I. Joe's. I collected them. And I quickly realized about 50 G.I. Joe guys in, okay, that there wasn't a G.I. Joe guy from Iowa where I grew up. Uh -huh. And I was pretty bummed about that, right? Okay. Because I was like, There's we, have, we have multiple G.I. Joe guys from California. Why are there none from Iowa, you know? Mm -hmm. And I actually wrote a letter to the toy company. And I said, hey, I'm this kid from a fort, little town in Iowa called Fort Dodge. I love G.I. Joe. Why isn't there a G.I. Joe guy from Iowa? Yeah, there are no soldiers. Does no one enlist and ever enlist from Iowa? Yeah, right. Yeah. 
Not to mention, you know, the pilot of uh, the Enola Gay was from Iowa. Okay. The person who planned the D-Day invasion was from Iowa. Okay. I mean, there's a long history of military, you know, heroes that have come from Iowa. Not to mention John Wayne is from Iowa, for God's sake. Come <laughs> on, work with me. I need Rick a, a better Riley hero than that, from, right? From MASH, you know? I mean, <laughs> like, there, there's plenty of Iowans. I never heard back from the toy company. Okay. I never heard back. About two years after I wrote this letter, I'm still loving G.I. Joe's, I'm still collecting G.I. Joe's, and I'm in the toy store, and I see this new G.I. Joe guy named Crazy Legs, and I flip over the packaging, and I find out that not only is Crazy Legs from Iowa, he's from Fort Dodge, Iowa. The oh, little no town- way. I just got chills, Joey. I live in, right? Yeah. So I'm blown away. This is amazing. <laughs> I get the G.I. Joe guy. This becomes one of my favorite G.I. Joe guys of all time, do to do. When Ben asked me about a moment of nostalgia in a story, I hadn't thought about Crazy Legs and this G.I. Joe guy in probably 20 years, probably more than 20 years. And so I told the story in the same way that I just told it to your listeners. Uh -huh. thought, there we go. And we, told, we talked about nostalgia and we moved on. About two months later, in the mail, I received this. Uh -huh. now, folks, for those of you that can't see, I am holding up a vintage, still in the package, Crazy Legs. Show us the card. Who is from Fort Dodge, Iowa, right? I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. You can see it right there, hometown, Fort Dodge, Iowa, right? And so the moral of the story is not, hey, G.I. Joes are awesome, or hey, thanks you know, to the toy company for making one from Fort Dodge. The moral of the story is when you know personal and emotional details about your customers, about your employees, you can create magical moments for them that are not at all about the dollar amount. They're about the thoughtfulness. They're about the impact. They're about proving to the customer or the employee that you were listening when they didn't think you were listening. To me, that's the secret for creating personal and emotional connections. Yeah, and it it gets so I so I love the story. I love you know I I want to I want to go get my own crazy legs because uh, <laughs> I just think it's so cool. Uh, and I love that you were the kid who was writing uh, you know writing letters to Hasbro or whoever was doing it. Um, so th so I love the story, and I and I love how you tied it together that you know, we're trying to make a connection with our employees, with maybe someone who leads the marketing division or the IT division, and we need them to, uh, you know, kind of support us or collaborate with us in order to get this initiative rolled out. Um, and without doing a bribe, we can make a connection with somebody by understanding them, by knowing them, by listening to them. And we can, you know, not run into that dollar amount for a bribe. We can get a stronger connection um, because we've heard somebody and we understand them and we were paying attention. Um, and we can do it with something that really kind of stands out from all the other things that, you know, usually happen in building relationships in business, right? Whether it's across kind of departmental lines or, you know, across kind of the company line to a customer, because that really stands out, right? You know, everybody can, uh, send you a $10 gift card for coming to the meeting or everyone, you know, I mean, uh, no offense to your promotional company that, that you worked at, but everyone can give you a squeeze ball with their logo on it, right? Oh, totally. And, and here's the thing, and uh, none offense taken, Gio. <laughs> I am not anti-promotional product. Mm -hmm. I just don't want you to think that it's a present. <laughs> it's, it's not yeah. a present. Yeah, it's no one's going a, home it's and just- a marketing just... tool. Yeah, no one's it's hugging like, their, oh, so their post-it notes. Squeeze bowl. Oh my God, the, just what I always wanted, post-it notes with my name on it. I mean, stop and imagine yourself. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, the, the client doesn't want to receive something with your logo on it. They just don't. A prospect- I hardly want to wear the Nike logo, let alone the oh, logo of my printing company. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, you know? And if we don't want to wear those clothes, why do we think that our clients or our customers <laughs> want to wear those clothes? And I would go as far as to say, sorry, hate to break it to you folks. Why do you think your employees want to wear those clothes? Because guess what? They don't. <laughs> they don't. 
Okay, like well, ours first... actually do, and they keep asking us to order new clothes. But now, most, now, I get it. Most companies well, don't. Don't. Yeah. But here's the thing. To your point, Gio, if it's your employees asking for it, yeah. it means you've created a culture they're proud of. Mm -hmm. If you are dictating compliance by saying you need to wear the shirt with our logo on it every day at work, that's not a gift. That's a uniform. Yes. I'm not opposed to uniforms. Okay. Yeah. Let's just not pretend it's a gift. Mm -hmm. So my theory is if you want to incorporate your branding into marketing materials, promotional materials, do it all day. If you want to incorporate it into your gifts and presence, think really long and hard about whether it's important to put the emblem of your brand on the gift or present. If I were to ask you, Gio, and any of our listeners can play this game along oh, as well, to make a list of the 10 best gifts you ever received in your life. And you were to sit down and you were to write down what those 10 gifts were. I can tell you two things for almost certain about that list. Number one, none of those gifts have the name or the logo of the person who gave it to you etched into it. <laughs> none of them, period. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Number two, almost every item on your list, if not every item on your list, costs less than $50. It probably costs less than $20 because it wasn't about the dollars they spent. It was about the thoughtfulness. They knew something about you that they, you didn't know they knew you that well, and they got you a gift that they knew you would love. And that's what touched you and what made it special. Not the, how, how big of a check did I have to write to get the gift? Exactly. Yeah, it's so key. And, um, you know, there's this concept of love languages and people kind of, uh, you know, they, they feel love if you do something for them or give them a compliment or some people have gifts. It's not mine. But as I've talked to people who, who, uh, who have that, they, you know, they're, they're talking about just what you're, what you're saying. You know, I, I was just talking to someone earlier this week and they said that that was their language. And she said, someone could give me a stick of gum or a packet of gum and a note on it. And it would absolutely make my day. It could cost 40 cents and have a note and they thought of me and they said something nice. And, you know, people who, you know, they, uh, they specialize in caring about gifts, talk about just what you're talking about, that it's not, oh, wow, you bought, you know, you, you bought me an $800 gift. It's like, oh, you were at the store and you saw this thing and you thought of me and I'm so glad that you got it. And we must be simpatico. You must have heard me. Um, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to even cost a dollar. Absolutely. If, if, if it hits the target. You know, a hundred percent. I agree with you. First of all, I love Gary Chapman's work. Uh, you know, the author of the five love languages. It's a fantastic book. It's a quick read. Take the quiz. My wife and I actually read it before we got married. Okay. And we retake the quiz every year because we've noticed over time our scores have shifted. When we oh. first started taking, I was you can get up to 12 points per category. I was zero out of 12 on gifts and presents. Uh-huh. My wife was 12 out of 12. Mm. So that creates an interesting dynamic because she was giving me these thoughtful gifts that, I mean, they were nice and I appreciate them, but they didn't light me up nearly the way of when I gave her a gift like that. Mm -hmm. There are five love languages. So if we just presume an even distribution across society, 20% of your employees, 20% of your clients and customers are gifts and presents is their number one love language. I guarantee there is someone in your organization that is really good at giving gifts. Mm -hmm. That's the person you want involved in all the gifting conversations. Usually the person who's trying to buy the gifts is not that person. It's huh. someone else on the team. They found themselves in that role and functionality. And that's why they say fruit baskets for everyone. <laughs> no, that's horrible. Don't do that. Starbucks gifts cards for everyone. It's not that I'm anti Starbucks. It's that nothing says I really care like a gift card. Stop it. Like, hey, go not... buy it yourself. Why don't you go yeah. shopping? Yeah, exactly. Let Here's me... an assignment. Go spend this before it expires. Exactly. And let me do a thing that makes it feel a little more personal than giving you money, but not really, because everybody knows that the value of the gift card is the thing that you're trying to associate value around, not the brand that you gave the gift card for. So the moral of the story here, I think, is there are huge opportunities to create connection, to create engagement, whether that's with your employees or with your clients and customers, by knowing about them, 
by paying attention to them. Uh, my good friend Neen James, Neen James wrote a great book called Attention Pays, which I thought is one of the best titles of a book recent in, uh, written in recent years, right? Because we're familiar with the concept of pay attention, but attention pays. And what she does is she breaks down the bottom line value to your business from paying attention. And uh, folks, powerful stuff works. It works. That's so cool. Um, yeah, and I, and I think that the more we can, you know, I, I think that a lot of ethics experts, we care about people and we want to help them and we want to do right by them. And, you know, some people kind of see it through doing this, you know, getting this system right or making sure that people can speak up or making sure that, you know, this bad thing doesn't happen. Um, but ultimately, as we're building our coalition and we're building our support as strategic contributors to the organization, we need more people outside of compliance to care about what we're doing. Um, and I think this is a great kind of, uh, you know, a great hack or a great approach to try to get that done of, you need to get to know those people. You need to understand them. You need to, you know, you have these internal customers who you need to make sure um, or, you know, do what you can to influence them to get on board and, you know, listening, understanding, caring and finding a way to, to to connect with them whether it's a gift or remembering that conversation or suggesting something to them that you know would be helpful um are are great ways to start building that yeah so, and, and you know it's interesting you uh, final thought on this yeah i think i empathize with the fact that as a society we're starting to realize this and get better at this some people in our society have known this all along but i think as a culture as Americans, and I know we've got listeners outside the United States as well, but in the United States, it's something that we're, uh, we're a little bit newer to the table on. You know, if you go to Asia, and I know you've spent some time in Asia, you know, in Japan, the gifting culture is insane. It's absolute, I mean, there's entire uh, body language and process around giving someone a gift and even presenting your business card in Asia is a gifting experience, right? And, and how that exchange works. I had the chance to spend some time in China, and if my research is correct, you, you studied some Mandarin, so I might butcher this <laughs> phrase, but it was the one phrase in Chinese that I really tried to pay attention to, and that's guanxi. Uh -huh. And it's my understanding- It's a big part of the culture. It's a big part of the culture, and for those that may not be familiar with guanxi, as I understand it, and you, you add on to this because you, you spent more time there than I have, guanxi is kind of the- the relationship juice that you have. It's like the connection you have with other people. It's your ability because of who you know and the connections and the personal and emotional uh, relationships you build over time that allows you to navigate and lubricate society and move through a little better. There's an actual phrase in Chinese to describe this. In my experience, we don't have anything like that in the English language. Yeah. Right? We, we don't have anything that encapsulates that as well, and I think that's a huge opportunity for us as a society to actually start to honor and elevate and seek out people who have that ability to kind of build those connections, to, to, to build that relationship juice, so to speak. Yeah, it's a great thing to bring up. And, you know, that Guangxi is a function of a much more collectivist culture that understands that your relationships and your family and your influence and your, your, your sphere of influence, they're all parts of this thing that we do. And, you know, I think our lens in Western society is all, uh, often very individualistic. And, you know, we, we maybe first see that type of influence based on, you know, formal authority and someone can tell people what to do. And, you know, that, you know, uh, I think it's always cool how, um, language in different cultures springs up to express these ideas that have dominance there, right? And you can see it in uh, Latin and Romance languages, you can see it in Asia and, and all of that. Um, but yeah, it, it recognizes that we have that juice, we have that relationship, we, th those things are present um, and you know, it's something to cultivate, right? So you know, we can talk about social capital or we can talk about putting things in, in the bank with other people and investing in them. And you know, I think a lot of people in our profession have a sense of that, have a sense of your obligation to society, have a sense of you know, doing something right even if you don't get uh, you know, immediate payback from it, you know, all those kind of things build your guangxi. And, you know, another, you know, the other side of that is showing appreciation for those things builds that human connection that really is the, you know, the, the fabric that ties our society together, 
you know, I think a lot of our formal structures of authority and power and things like that are often expressions of those things that to try to kind of put a name and structure around it. But, you know, uh, when you open up the box, it's really all of that human connection. Agreed. Uh, so we've jumped into a bunch of stuff and I've loved it. This has been a great conversation. I, I, I want to talk specifically about your book, Joey, because it's awesome. Um, I think it has a lot to teach us, not just about this, this approach to gifting, but this, you know, who is your customer? How do you understand them? Um, I'd love to start with, you know, I, I, I'd love to hear what the nexus, what the origin of this book was, what, you know, what caused you to say, you know what, this is the book that I have to write. Um, and then we can get into talking about what's in there and, you know, how wonderful it ended up being after all those, uh, uh, after that labor of love. Oh, I appreciate that. Well, you know, like most things in life, Gio, uh, it was not a singular nexus point. It was a, a number of contributing factors. Uh, some of the top ones being I was running an ad agency where my job was to drive as many new customers to the door. And I was working on a particular project with one of my clients where the goal was to make the phone ring basically. Uh, and we were making the phone ring off the hook and they were getting tons of new customers. About three months later, I was meeting with them and I said, can we put together a report on the metrics of how much your business has grown? And the client got a little sheepish and uh, I said, what, what's wrong? And they said, well, Joey, you, you made the phone ring like crazy. We got all these new clients, um, but our overall revenues really haven't grown that much. I said, really, how is that possible? And we dove deep into the numbers and what we realized is that we were getting them a lot of new clients, but they were losing their old clients. The typical client in their business would stay for about a year and a half, maybe two years, and then they would leave. Uh, whereas before, historically, they had had clients that would be with them for 20 or 30 years. And what we realized is that most businesses are really good at acquiring new customers and are absolutely horrible at retaining customers. And when this happened, uh, it rocketed me, rocketed me back to a job that I have, which I didn't even mention actually in my list of careers, uh, where I was doing business consulting for Fortune 500 companies. And we did some research where we looked at how quickly customers leave. What we found is that somewhere between 20 and 70% of new customers will decide to stop doing business with you in the first 100 days of the relationship. 20 to 70%. Now, I don't know about you, Gio, but I found those numbers staggering. And I think this is the biggest threat to business today that very few companies are talking about. People are talking about- Your ad agency is not going to tell you that about your pay-per-click no, ads. No, exactly. You know, And so everybody's talking about, and I get it, the human condition is one of chasing, not <laughs> keeping, right? We are drawn to the chase. For most people, they find dating more exciting than marriage, right? They find chasing new clients more exciting than service existing clients. This is the way we are hardwired biologically as humans. However, if you want to build something sustainable, if you want to build something that stands the test of time and continues to deliver value for years and years to come, this acquisition chase only mentality and approach is not going to serve you well. And so when I realized how many customers were running out the back door as quickly as you could bring them in the front, when I realized that this was a problem that was pervasive across all industries, not just the individual companies that I was working with, but we were seeing it across all industries, I realized that number one, it was an issue, and number two, somebody needed to solve it. And so I spent several years, almost a decade, trying to figure out how to solve it implementing things with my clients, doing research, you know, reading uh, analysis, and, analysis and reports from large companies and looking at the different best practices everybody was doing. And we put together a model of how to navigate the customer journey through eight phases. And if you consciously identify what phase your customer is in, what their emotional state is at the time they're in that phase, and what you can do to not only address their emotional state, but advance them to the next phase, you can get your customers to stay longer than 100 days. And the research also shows if on day 101, they're feeling fabulous about their relationship with you. In the typical business, they will stay for five years. So this is an incredible time period in the customer relationship. And in fact, I would posit, and the research supports the fact that there is no more valuable time 
in the entire customer relationship. There is no time that is more dispositive of the lifetime value of the relationship than what happens in the first 100 days. Yeah, that's great. It's a huge insight. And, um, you know, you're, you're right that a lot of people, you know, get there, there are probably thousands more companies and consultancies and agencies who are going to help you get customers than ones that are going to help you keep customers. And oh, 100%. I mean, yeah. and, it, and it's not just the agencies. If we were to go on Amazon today and you were to search the keyword marketing under the category of books and write down how many hits you get, and then to search the keyword sales, write down how many hits you get, add them together, you'd get about 1.3 million books that have been written on sales and marketing. Now, if you were to erase those results and you were to type in customer retention, customer success, customer experience, customer service, account, account management, loyalty management, customer loyalty, all the phrases, all the word combinations you could come up with to describe what happens after the sale, you'd get barely 30,000 books. Okay. So for those of you that were told there would be no math in today's call, what that <laughs> basically means, I'll do the math for you, for every 43 books that have been written on how to get a customer, one book is written on how to keep a customer something to think about. Yeah, it's a big thing. And, um, you know, it's something that we at Compliance Line, you know, it, it was part of our culture before I came here. And it's something that we continue to invest in. And, you know, we have more support people per capita than our competitors. And we have more account management people, you know, everyone says you have a dedicated account manager. And usually that just means they're just saying that the one person they spread across the 8,000 people, uh, they're very dedicated. Um, and, you know, uh, but, you know, we, we've invested in that. And, you know, we, we show it with, you know, our headcount, we show it with the time we spend on our customers, we show it with the, you know, the analysis and, and the focus that we have. Um, because we've realized that not only is it good for us, to keep that relationship going, but it's good for our clients because at, if you have to change every two years because someone let you down and you got to onboard someone new, you have the, uh, you know, the search and the RFP process and the vetting and all the demos and all that, you have all that pre-buying effort that we as a company do to get a new vendor. And then you have the transition, the implementation fees and the onboarding and retrain everybody, all of that. And then you have this ramp up period and most people end up I kind of making that like ending up with somebody bad because uh, in my experience, and there's a lot of data to back this up, like satisfaction with third party vendors is super low. And most people end up in one of two bad camps when they get a bad vendor, they either stay with them too long to try to get their return and say, Hey, you know, uh, you know, they end up kind of suffering through it and making do, or they end up transitioning before they kind of get to their payback period, right? We're going to, we're going to spend $50,000 on this implementation and we got to keep this thing for five years in order to get payback on that. They end up, you know, either staying too long to like try to get their money back and suffering, or they end up leaving too early and they never hit their ROI anyways. And we, you know, we think that it's a tragedy um, in our, you know, in our modern, modern culture, that's so much, not just money, but time and heartache and performance is wasted on establishing a bad business relationship. And we realize that, Hey, you know what? It's a way like investing in this is a way to serve our customers while they're with us. And it also, if we can solve those problems and, you know, we do voice of the customer and NPS and all of that stuff and we say, okay, well, if we can fix this then it's good for us. And it's also good for them because they don't have to go through all the brain damage of trying to find a new vendor. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's something that I think people are waking up to that if you can find somebody to work with, who's not just a provider, but a partner, not just a vendor, but someone who's an extension of your team, then your job is going to get done better. And, you know, we believe that the job that ethics experts have is supremely important to keep people safe and to get alignment and get strength in the, in the culture. And, you know, we, we invest in that, not just out of our own interest, but because it serves our mission of helping make the world a better workplace. Joe, a hundred percent. I mean, you know, we started this conversation uh, on a, an analysis of the nomenclature around the word compliance. Uh, something you said there really stood out to me. And when you said third party vendor, um, it's a punch in the face, both parts of that phrase, third party. There's nothing that could describe somebody who you don't want in a relationship more than a third party. Right. Second of all, vendor, 
nobody loves their vendor, okay? You love your partner. And the problem is so many people in marketing and sales, and I'm not being critical of all marketing and salespeople, but I have no problem being critical of the ones who try to push this, well, we're your thought partner. We're your strategic ally. No, guess what? You don't get to say that. You get to earn that. Okay, so you may say that as part of your marketing messaging and you're going to drive me crazy because to me, those words shouldn't leave your lips. They should leave my lips when I'm talking about what it's like to work with you. So to me, this is about a sea change shift in how we think about doing business. And when we actually look at the ROI on the relationships and we look at you know, what actually comes from having a deep relationship with the various partners that your business has, it informs how we should think about our employees as well. Because what it leads to is greater engagement. At the end of the day, all the research shows on the HR side that employee engagement is lying on the ground. I used to think when I wrote Never Lose a Customer Again, I thought that the worst data and the worst metrics in the country were around customer experience and what customers thought of interacting with brands. Then I started working and researching what employees thought of their employers, and I realized that that's an even bigger problem, that most employees are looking. And by looking, I mean they are looking for another job right now. So if you're not paying attention to your employee engagement, how can you ever expect to have anything even close to a remarkable customer engagement or customer experience? They're two sides of the same coin. As you improve one, you improve the other. As you let one fall, the other falls with it. Yeah, it's such a good point. And um, I love that you're on it and you have realized that, you know, we believe at our core here at Compliance Line that we're never going to have a huge swath of customers who love our company if we don't have a bunch of employees who love working here because you know they you know think of the box of your building they're they're two sides of the same box and your your employee you know those those interactions that a customer has with your brand are driven by the interactions that they have with your employees and the way that your employees think about your internal brand influences how customers see your external brand. It's one brand, it's one company, it's one organism. And uh, you know, what, they, which way is the force gonna go? It's gonna go from employees to customers. You're not going to tell your customers that you're strategic and they're gonna make your employees strategic good partners, right? It, the, your sphere of influence kind of resonates out from you to your team, to the rest of your employees, to the people who work with you. And that's a big reason why you know, people are waking up to the fact that ethics and integrity and compliance professionals are the most underutilized, under leveraged strategic asset in organizations, because we can drive that forward. We can improve employee engagement. We can help build a stronger culture and that's gonna impact our innovation. And it's gonna impact our success with customers and our customer retention and all of these other things that matter. Um, it starts with our people. And you know, nobody is going to be in an interview and not say that, yes, our people are our greatest asset and we love our, our, our resources that are humans are our favorite resources. No one's allowed to say no to that, but people say no to it all the time with their actions. And uh, you know, I think that there's a movement afoot to include your employees as stakeholders. It seems like so often we look at our shareholders and then we also like our customers because they pay our shareholders. And if there's anything left over, sure, you know, make sure that the bathrooms are clean for the employees. Um, and we just think that that's, that's really upside down. We think that if you take care of employees and they're engaged, then your customers are gonna be happy and your community and your shareholders are gonna be happy when that works well. 100%. Couldn't agree more, Gio. Um, so tell me uh, what we haven't talked about from Never Lose a Customer again. Well, I, you know, the, it's, it's interesting. The, the book has 46 case studies of companies, small, medium, and large, that are doing uh, remarkable things across the customer journey to keep their customers coming back for more. I think if I was going to uh, 
boil it down to a couple of key takeaways. I mean, we already talked about the importance of the first 100 days. We talked about the importance of paying attention to the customer journey and knowing where you are in the journey. Um, in terms of a, some kind of practical things that your listeners could implement right now, and not only as it relates to their customers, but even with their employees, um, one of the things I like to look at is modes of communication. So I believe there are six key tools you can use to communicate with your customers. You have the in or your employees as well. You have your in-person interactions, right? You have emails, which is what most businesses over-index on email. And yet I would ask this question of all your listeners, do any of you wish that you were getting more email? Probably not. And yet that's the number one tool we're using. Folks, just take your own personal beliefs about this stuff and pretend that people are like you and you'll actually be pretty fine, right? You don't need to do a survey of 8,000 people to figure no. out that people don't love swimming in their inbox. Exactly, exactly. We've also got physical mail, which is probably you know the original inbox or the OG inbox, which I would say of the tools is one of the least used tools now, which means, by the way, it's less crowded there. So how are you using physical mail? We've got the phone and I don't just mean the apps and you know the social media tools. I mean the actual typing in some numbers and someone on the other end picks up and you can have a real-time conversation. It's a novel new technology, brand new app kids downloaded in the app store today. Uh, we've got video and we've got gifts and presents. The reason I cite those six tools is to ask your listeners, which ones are you over-indexing on? Which ones are you using too much? How could you spread your communications across a variety of tools to not only have different types of touch points with your customers and your employees, but to potentially have touch points that get to them faster and resonate with them deeper? So if I think about sending an email to you, Geo, and I'm like, hey, Geo, just wanted to let you know I was thinking of you, blah, 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 blah. You may read it, you may not. Most of the research shows a typical email gets read somewhere between 48 hours and 72 hours after receipt. Okay, that's what most of the research shows. Now let's in instead pretend that I shot a selfie video and I texted it to you. Are you gonna watch that? Are you gonna get a different feel for the tonality of my message? Is it gonna feel much more hyper-personalized? Is it gonna come to a place that is not overwhelmed? You're not getting a ton of video text messages every day, right? So it's gonna stand out. And the research actually shows that a video text message sent to somebody gets viewed in its entirety, on average, within 90 seconds of receipt. Now, I don't know about you, but I would rather have my clients consuming my information and consuming it quickly as opposed to it falling into a sea of, you know, nothingness. Yeah. Now, how does this relate to compliance? Well, the same six tools can be applied internally to your employees and your customers and the other stakeholders. If you're the compliance officer who usually is just sending emails about compliance, stop and think about whether a phone call might be more interesting. Or stop and think about whether shooting a video personalized for that individual and sending it to them might be more powerful. There's a great company called BombBomb, B-O-M-B, B-O-M-B, BombBomb, that creates, uh, that has a tool that sits on your browser, it pairs with Gmail really nicely. And what it allows you to do is to shoot a video that gets embedded in the email and it goes to them and then they see the video and they click on it and they can watch the video. So you can still send the email if that's your preferred mode of communication, but you get the lift of it being a video, right? Yeah. So I think there's huge opportunities to incorporate other forms of communication when we're getting our message out, whether that's to our customers or our employees. That's a great point, Joey. And, you know, I think it's something that we're hearing more and more conversations about within our industry and our profession. And people are starting to ask us, hey, how can you help me with this awareness program? Hey, you know, what do you have? You know, there's been the poster on the wall of call the hotline and, you know, hey, here, you know, you, you, you give someone a folder when they get here with your 80 page uh, code of conduct. And, you know, people are waking up to not only like did that stuff never work that well, but also people, you know, we're more attention starved than we ever have. We're inundated with all of these messages and ethics experts need to compete in this digital world of all of these different messages and notifications and all the different stuff that someone has to go through. And uh, people are waking up to the fact that, okay, 
what worked 10 years ago, what worked in the 90s when the lawyers were just telling us to put a policy together, like it never worked that well and it's working even less now. And people are engaging in conversations of, hey, how do I, you know, how do I make this program, you know, how do I use, uh, you know, psychology to get a message across? How do I, how do I use different media to get a message across? How do I meet people where they are and engage them in something that they're, that's going to stand out and is going to stick with them instead of one of the 18,000 emails that you've gotten since Monday. Um, and people are waking up to it. You know, we still have some challenges because we're, you know, we're not, we, we haven't been doing this uh, in compliance and ethics for 10 years and, you know, have all the tools in place. But there, there are a few things that we can do that end up making a big impact on the receptivity of our employees to the messages we're bringing across. 100%. And, you know, one of, we, we started our conversation with talking about my eclectic career. Yeah. One of the uh, benefits of that eclectic career is I've never been limited by the perspective of the industry I'm in. So while I certainly respect and understand the fact that these are newer conversations in the compliance world, they are not new conversations in the marketing world. Yes. The marketing world has been trying to increase awareness and get attention since the first advertisement right? Since the first effort to try to get someone to buy something or do something. So what's fascinating to me, and this is going to be a sweeping generalization here, so forgive me. In most large organizations that I've experienced, if you were to pick two departments that don't like each other, it would be marketing and sales versus compliance, right? Those are the two that butt head the most. Compliance usually doesn't have a lot of problems with the other departments as much as it has with marketing and sales. And marketing and sales usually complain the loudest and the most about compliance. Here's the fascinating thing. Sweeping generalization approaching again. The marketing and salespeople as a general rule love to be seen as valuable and intelligent and uh, having a, a special expertise. Why? Because they're human. All <laughs> humans love this, right? So guess what, folks? Everybody likes this. Surprise, surprise. So what if you're on the compliance team and you want awareness for your new thing? What if you actually went to the marketing department and said, you guys are experts in getting the marketplace to know about our next product or our next widget or our next offering? Could you help us get the word out internally about this new thing we're gonna do. In my experience, when compliance goes to marketing and asks for that, marketing is gonna help, why? Because if marketing is coming from a, an altruistic place, they're saying, oh, I get to help out somebody in my company. If they're coming from a less altruistic place, they get to say, ha ha, once again, compliance needs me to survive. You know, blah, blah, I kinda don't care yeah, what they think let's about get the it. help and let's, let's get, get it done. Help. And let's you know what? You're an expert and I'd love your advice and people love hearing that. A hundred percent. And now when compliance has an issue with that person in marketing, do you think they're going to be more receptive to some feedback on how their activity or their plan or their program is violating or pushing up against compliant rules? Yes, because you will have created a personal and emotional connection with that person. Folks, this stuff isn't rocket science. Okay. It's not. And I don't say that from a place of ego. I say that from a place of uh, empathy and wanting to help. Don't make this harder than it has to be. Don't over architect this. Humans are humans, period. Now, granted, we all have our own perspectives and our own life experience that indicate who we are and how we see the world and our blueprint of how we react to things. But the reality is there are some core basic tenets of humanity that if you connect with those, a lot of the other stuff takes care of itself. Yeah, there's a lot more that unites us than divides us. And you can look at people in those other departments and say, oh, those are the engineers, I can't talk math. And those are the marketers and they're always uh, you know, doing whiteboards. Or you can look at, okay, well, they have something that I don't. And we all have this, this common human experience and we're all part of the same company, the same tribe going after the same mission. And you know, let's work together. Absolutely. 
Um, so tell me about what's next and tell me how people can track you, support you, hear, hear more. You, 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 your next book is focused on internal customers, your employees. Um, so give us a little preview about that um, and tell, tell us how people can uh, get in touch with you. Yeah, so the, the book is a work in progress. It's going to be called Never Lose an Employee Again. It's okay. going to be all about the employee journey. And how can we focus on the first 100 days of the employee experience using those same six tools to make the experience remarkable and turn a rotating door of employees into long-term, sustainable, engaged workforce and team. So that's what it's going to be all about. Uh, continuing to do the research on it, continuing to speak on it and consult on it now uh, in the same way that I wrote my first book. Uh, I didn't want it to be a theoretical guide. I wanted it to be an evergreen practical guide that actually folks could keep on their shelf and use again and again for many years to come. So we're approaching the second book the same way. Um, in terms of connecting with me, I mean, my first book, Never Lose a Customer Again, is available at your favorite bookstore. It's available on Amazon. We've got ebook version. We've got a hardcover version. If you've enjoyed listening to me speak, there's an audio version that I narrate. Uh, to check that out as well. So lots of different ways to consume that. Since we're on a podcast, I uh, feel compelled to mention that I've actually got a show called Experience This that I co-host with my good buddy, Dan Gingis, who kind of represents the perspective of Fortune 100, Fortune 500 companies. He was uh, working on customer experience issues with Discover Card and Humana and McDonald's. I kind of bring the uh, small to medium-sized business perspective of, you know, how can we be more creative uh, and less let's do it the same way. Uh, in our approach. So yeah, we have a show called Experience This that we're in. We're about ready to launch season six. So hundreds of episodes already in the can and out there for folks. It's a great cast. I really love uh, your vibe and you guys have, you know, you guys have done a, a bunch of episodes. I haven't listened to all hundreds of them, uh, but you guys bring uh, a real nice perspective that's practical and engaging uh, and entertaining. So people should definitely oh, thanks, check, check really out Experience This. Yeah. yeah, no, I really appreciate that. And we, and we tried to create something. It's uh, there are 10 minute segments. So they're short, consumable bites of customer experience delight. And to be honest, we really only talk about the positive customer experience stories. We believe there's enough negative customer experience news in the world. We try to do our bit to bring some more positivity to it. So long story short, if people want to connect, the best place to find me is at my website, joeycoleman.com. That's J-O-E-Y, like a five-year-old you know, or a baby kangaroo, Joey. Coleman, C-O-L-E-M-A-N, like the camping equipment but no relation, joeycoleman.com. There's videos there. You can reach out. Um, like I said, I do speaking, I do consulting, I do private coaching, and I just really appreciate the opportunity to come on your show, Gio. Yeah, well, you've uh, blessed us, Joey, with your ideas and your perspectives on this. Um, it, it's I, I didn't know when we met um, that the employee book was coming up, but you know, I, I saw so much in your book about customers that can apply to ethics experts, and you know, in so many ways, our customers are the the board and the execs that we serve, and the employees all around the company who we serve. Um, and uh, I, I I love that you've seen kind of that that extension. Um, I you know I'll, I'll have to check on Amazon what the ratio of sales and marketing books to employee retention and engagement books are. It may be even more dismal than, uh, than the customer engagement and retention, um, but it's been great. You've, you've given us some actionable um, items. You've, you've helped us understand some other people and other divisions around us, um, and, and you're helping all of us move from that kind of defensibility, kind of legal um, you know, compliance 1.0 to this 3.0 where we're going to get engagement, where we're going to be effective, um, and we're, we're going to drive a stronger culture as a strategic asset within, uh, within our company. So thanks for being on the show, Joey. Uh, everyone, please remember to check out joeycoleman.com. Check out Never Lose a Customer Again, um, and check out Experience This to get more of Joey and more of these great insights.